Okay, well, good morning, everyone. We might go ahead and um, make a start. Welcome. It's lovely to see those of you who are in the room and um, great to see so many people joining us on Zoom as well. So I'm Liz Eakin. I'm the head of our School of Public Health here at the University of Queensland. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here for our human rights event. Um, I am going to turn to Professor Sandra Kima in just a minute for an acknowledgement, but I did also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're on, pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, extend that respect to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who are joining us. I also want to particularly welcome the members of First Friends Refugee Communities who are with us today, and of course we'll be hearing from um, some wonderful representatives of, of those communities. Um, Scott McDougall, Commissioner McDougall, it's an absolute pleasure and, and honor to, to welcome you as Queensland's Commissioner for Human Rights to, to speak with us today. Um, I wanted to also really acknowledge the work of Dr. Nina Lansbury and again, Professor Sandra Creamer in bringing, bringing us together and organizing this event and our wonderful support from um, EUQ Marketing as well. So Mila, thank you. Um, just a little public health announcement because it would be remiss of me not to, but we you know we're in the midst, unfortunately, of another COVID wave here in Queensland. So um, if you're if you're inclined, we're pretty reasonably distanced in the room, but there are masks in the back if you would like. There's plenty of hand sanitizer, um, and I do wish you all a very safe and, and healthy um, summer and holiday season. So just just briefly, and then I'll turn it over to um, Sandra. It's it's wonderful to be able to get together and celebrate International Human Rights Day, which is tomorrow. Um, the, the, that work, um, that, that ethos, the values are, are very much aligned with um, what we do and what we believe in our School of Public Health, in particular social justice and health equity underpin all the work we do in the school. Um, we have a, a wonderful health equity project that um, Professor Kramer is, is giving, um, giving leadership to, um, led by Professor Marie Toombs, who's our Associate Dean Indigenous Engagement, and it's um, I'm not sure if Claire Brolin and, and others from the team are, are on the line today, but that project is, oh, and, and Carla Good, <laughs> thank you. Um, so that, that project is looking particularly at health equity in, in relation to healthcare for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, across Queensland. But um, I guess back more broadly to the, to the topic of human rights, I, I just, it's incredible to be here in Queensland. It's incredible to see the kind of leadership we've had. And again, Scott, I'll, I'll credit to you to be, I think, the first and still only state to actually have a, a human rights um, act passed here. And, and of course, it, it allows us to do the kind of, of health equity work and really strongly, strongly um, in, embed that. Um, I think uh, again, Sandra, your your leadership here and internationally through through the UN um, in this space is something we admire. We very honored to have you as, as an adjunct in our school and and to work with you to um, bring together events like this. Um, again, we're looking forward to hearing from many of our speakers from the refugee communities today to um, understand their stories and and um, hear about the work that they're doing as well. Um, so I think with that, I will I will turn over to Professor Kramer for um, yeah, a bit more of an acknowledgement. And thank you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to pay acknowledgement to the land that we're on, the Yagara and the Turrbal people. I'd like to acknowledge also where I'm from. I'm a Kalkadoon Wanyi, and I'd like to acknowledge where the land I live on is in Durumba country. I'd like to also acknowledge my elders past and present, and especially the elders who are still standing here today, because they, have, they are the ones who have stood and made a hard stand for us as Indigenous peoples. They've given me strength, they have given me wisdom, and they've given me the strong spirit that I am here who I am today, because they continually fight in the legal system for our rights. They continually fight the system where we are the most legislated peoples in this country. And they also continue to be a voice for our language and culture for us to retain that. So I really pay my respects to them. And I'd like to also thank Scott, um, Lee, and Shay and Nina for putting for coming here today on this important day. International Human Rights. 
everybody has a right and everybody should know about human rights. And I think tomorrow is one of the most important days that I believe that people should know about and should have, and that we as people here in Australia, we need to understand the violations of rights of human beings in this country. And especially we do have violations in this country that are happening to somebody that you may not even know. There are people out there who remain invisible, who remain silent, but they are suffering because of breach of their violations of their human rights. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So I'm, my name's Nina Lansbury, and I'm just really thrilled to have you all in the room and on Zoom this morning. So the way that this morning's wonderful set of presenters is, are going to come to you is that we've got a keynote presentation by um, Scott McDougall, Dougal, the Queensland Commissioner for Human Rights. And um, as you will have seen in the, in the bios and heard from Professor Eakin, he is the first and continuing commissioner um, under the Human Rights Act of Queensland 2019. So Scott, if you can come to the podium and we've rearranged the view, yes, so we can see you. And, um, and then we'll shift to Professor Sandra Creamer and then we'll go to our two panelists. So thank you, over to you. Thank you, Nina, and good morning, everyone. Happy Human Rights um, Day tomorrow. So I don't know how many of you would know, but um, uh, back in 1948, the uh, signing of a really important document, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights was made. So the 10th of December, 1948. And I was saying to Sandra um, just a moment ago that this, Theatre actually reminds me a bit of the United Nations building um, in New York, much smaller scale, obviously. Um, but I did have the, the great fortune of um, presenting uh, at an uh, ageing conference, actually, at the United Nations uh, in 2018. And it really struck me how... Um, just the, the architecture of the building. If you're ever in New York, I would encourage you um, to go and try and get in and have a look. It is quite difficult to get in, but if you can get in, it's an amazing building and it, it really is quite awesome because essentially the Rockefeller family gave up a huge chunk of their real estate to the world in the aftermath of you know, the Second World War and said, this is you know, our gift to the world please use it to bring peace to the world. That's essentially the notion behind it. And it really is quite awe-inspiring. And when you see this Australia's involvement in those early days and how important it was to supporting the, the foundational uh, conventions of, of human rights, it's really important that we maintain that internationally and internationally that respect for human rights. So... It's important we don't criticise UNESCO, for example, if they say that if they list the Barrier Reef as being endangered, they're doing it for a reason. It's important we don't criticise them and shoot the messenger. That was a very uh, long introduction. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of this country. And um, like Sandra, I also wanted to acknowledge um, all the Aboriginal people that I've had the good fortune of working with throughout the course of my career. Um, we don't hear many people talk about just uh, the value that Aboriginal society brings to the broader Australian community. And I have, as I said, been fortunate to work with Aboriginal communities for large parts of my career. And I can tell you, I have learned so much from Aboriginal elders and you know committees, I've learned about accountability to to the community, accountability for outcomes, um, respect, dignity, grace under pressure. All these things are things that I have learned that I would never have learned if I hadn't have worked so closely with Aboriginal communities. 
So today I took up the challenge of not bringing slides, which you probably should all be clapping about. Um, yeah. And I was asked to, to talk to four things. So they were a short history of the act, the need for the act, the impact of the act so far, and the potential of the act in the future. So a short history of the act. So I actually brought, I did bring the act with me and I would encourage you to go and actually look at it because this is the explanatory notes as well. So the act itself is not big. You know, it's like that big, beautiful. We've got some other products from the commission. Excellent. Um, and I would encourage you to just go and read it because it is fairly simple. And I do have to correct you, Liz, it's not the, the first Human Rights Act in Australia. So uh, Victoria and the ACT have human rights legislation in place. Queensland followed them. But um, I am Queensland's first Human Rights Commissioner, which is also very cool. So um, the Act was introduced on the 1st of July 2019 and it imposed obligations on public entities, which is essentially uh, departments, uh, from the 1st of January 2020. And those obligations really are to give proper consideration to human rights and act compatibly with human rights when making decisions that affect people's human rights. And there are 23 rights protected by the Act, and I, I should say categories of rights because some of those rights have multiple rights built into them. And most of those rights are drawn from civil and political rights, the Convention on uh, Civil and Political Rights. Um, some are drawn from economic, social and cultural rights. So importantly for today's discussion, the right to access health services, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment the right to education, uh, and importantly also, uh, the Act protects unique Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural rights, which are drawn from the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So that's essentially the, the, the framework for the Act. In Queensland, Queensland is unique to the other uh, jurisdictions in that Queensland introduced an ability to make a complaint when a person feels that their human rights have been unjustifiably limited. And that complaint comes to my commission. We don't have, we have the power to bring people together to try and resolve that complaint. And then if it's not successfully resolved, then we can publish a report, which includes recommendations about what that public entity should do to comply with the act in the future. So, so far, for example, we've done one of those reports in relation to hotel quarantine during the um, pandemic. So you might remember when the COVID broke out um, and people were put into hotel rooms. Initially, some of those hotel rooms were completely unsuitable. They had no, in one, one case, there were no, literally no windows in a hotel room. Imagine being locked in a, a room with no windows for 14 days. Um, and others uh, didn't have uh, access to fresh air or to balconies. So that was that was probably the first major report we did under the, the Human Rights Act. And it, it did result in some changes, not complete changes, I have to say. Um, so In terms of the, the need for the Act, which is the second item, uh, having spent most of my career as a criminal lawyer, native title lawyer, and then as the director of a, a large community legal centre, I found myself in situations where I had a client whose human rights were very obviously limited by decisions of the state but with no ability to take any action on behalf of that client. So there was nothing you could do for them. 
if they had a potential discrimination um, complaint, it might be that because of the complexity of discrimination law, which I won't go into, um, they would not be able to actually successfully take any action. So that frustration really led me to participating in the campaign for a human rights act in Queensland. And, but there are other reasons why we, why we need a human rights act, particularly in Queensland. One is that we do not have an upper house in our parliament. We have a unicameral parliamentary system. So it's really important that there is, there are checks on executive decision-making and the human rights act does provide a framework for that. We live in a society with growing inequality. And when I come to beautiful places like this, I have to admit, you should all feel so privileged that you are able to access a place like this and receive an education because I can tell you, and when I go to Mount Isa with, with uh, Aunty Sandra, the stark reality of the fact that notionally everyone in Queensland, all 5 million of us, is a human being protected by the Human Rights Act. But when I go for a drive with Aunty Sandra through the back streets of Mount Isa, I can tell you that not everyone is enjoying and has the ability to access their human rights. So growing inequality is another reason why we need the Human Rights Act. Um, it's also easier, as I mentioned, because of the limitations of our discrimination laws to make, to make a case. So if you take, for example, at the moment in Queensland, we have a real problem with children from the, potentially from the ages of 10 years old. Think about it, a 10 year old child can be locked up in a watch house for days and sometimes in some cases, almost two weeks um, for just being charged with, with an offence. So addressing that issue without a Human Rights Act is very difficult. You could try and argue that it's discri race discrimination, but it is far easier to argue that children's rights to humane treatment whilst de deprived of liberty are being unjustifiably limited. So that is a matter where there's ongoing litigation at the moment and something that my commission is looking closely at as well. So the third thing I was asked to talk about was the impact of the act so far. And I can say that because of the obligation that's imposed on public entities and because there is a risk that a complaint will be made to my commission about decision making, I think we have already seen an improvement in the way that uh, agencies handle their own complaints. So there's a requirement before you can make a human rights complaint to us, you have to have first made a complaint to the public entity involved. So I think that has, we've actually seen some improvements in the way that internal complaints are being dealt with. Um, the second impact we've seen is through the courts. So again, I won't go into the detail of it because it's, it's just too complex, but there is a mechanism for going, for raising human rights issues in courts. And so far, We've seen a prisoner who was held in solitary confinement for over seven years, successfully judicially review those decisions. And so he was moved out of solitary confinement. Um, yeah, I would shake your head too, because it's terrible someone be held in solitary confinement for seven years. Um, moved out of solitary confinement um, after a Supreme Court judge ruled that that was an unjustifiable limitation of on that person's human rights. You may have heard a recent case come down just in the last couple of weeks about Waratah Coal. Anybody hear about that? So very groundbreaking case. So it's the land court and a group called Youth Verdict um, working together with traditional owners from the Torres Strait. 
challenged um, a mining lease application on behalf of uh, Clive Palmer's Waratah Coal. And the land court in rejecting the application um, relied on the need to protect the right to life uh, and the cultural rights of Torres Strait Islanders. So really important decision and it will, but again, one will be following with a lot of interest. Uh, we've also had, um, I mentioned before the quarantine uh, process and report we published. We also had another one um, in relation to the Adani mine where Aboriginal protesters made a complaint to us about having their camp uh, being, being threatened with removal from their camp by police. So they made a complaint, we brought the parties together and it resulted in an agreement by police that they wouldn't attempt to move the protesters again and they actually apologised and again that was on the basis of the exercise of cultural rights. Um, <clears throat> so the, the other aspect and impact of the Act, and this is where the real value of the Human Rights Act kicks in. So again, without getting too loyally and technical, what the Act does is imposes this obligation on public entities to act compatibly with human rights. What that means is that when someone makes a decision where they potentially could affect the rights of other people, they have to actively look for alternative ways of achieving what they want to achieve that would have less impact on the human rights of those affected by that decision. That's essentially the heart of the Human Rights Act. It forces decision makers to look for less um, impactful, less restrictive options. And in public health decision making, I think this, this is where it's really critical because when you, you're talking about the right to access health services, then you're talking about funding decisions about where the services go. And I don't think we've seen the Act yet fully engaged in that area, but I think in the future, it certainly will. So when you're looking at, you know, which Indigenous communities have access to dialysis, they're the sort of decisions where I think I would certainly like to see advocacy, if not litigation, I'm not encouraging litigation for the sake of it, but it is a way of achieving outcomes um, where rights to access health services without discrimination are advocated. Am I going for time? Four minutes. So I've just started touching on the potential of, of the Act. And I guess with COVID, it was a pretty amazing time to introduce the Human Rights Act on the 1st of January, 2020. I think it was the 13th of March and I was at a speaking at a forum. We didn't know whether it was what was going to happen. And then by the end of that afternoon, pretty much everything just shut down and human rights were just being restricted left, <laughs> left, right and centre. So there were pros and cons with that one. Um, Pro was that it really did educate a lot of people about human rights and health um, decision makers in particular really had to take into, a, into account human rights when they were making all these decisions about lockdowns, about masks, um, the vaccines and the border closures. So all of those decisions engaged human rights, resulted in us getting absolutely completely smashed with, with complaints. Um, and it's not just, you know, the Karen from Bunnings type people. There were a lot of genuine 
mask complaints, for example. Um, one example I give you is a, a pregnant woman who was trying to get to a really important obstetrics um, consultation and was told by reception there was no way she was getting in the building if she didn't have a mask. She had a particular history, which um, I won't talk about, but if you knew, you would understand immediately why she would not be wanting to put a mask on her face. And um, she made a complaint and it really demonstrated the value of our complaint mechanism because very quickly we were able to turn that around well, within a matter of hours, I think it was, get her in and Queensland Health responded, you know, fantastically to it once they, they appreciated the significance of, of the situation. Um, so COVID um, was, you know, it was like a human rights bonanza really. Um, one thing about it that I think is interesting is Queensland Health were very keen to rely on the positive obligation on governments to protect the right to life as the basis for all of the draconian restrictions that they imposed. And at the time, I made a few statements saying, well, look, yes, the, and it was very difficult for us because we had to um, protect human rights whilst not undermining the public health message, which obviously was critically important. Um, but we had to say, look, that that's true the right to life does impose positive obligations to protect life and you see that in the waratah coal decision but it is not a blank check just to go and override human rights willy-nilly you still have to make decisions proportionate to the to the needs of the and rights of the people that you're affecting with the decision so um I probably got about a minute to go and um, I'll use that by saying, I think there is limitless potential for the act. What we need to do is get amongst the community and explain that human rights are not things just for academics and for lawyers. They're for everyone in the community. We need nurses to be aware of human rights. We need social workers to be aware of human rights. We need people to be able to advocate on human rights every day without go even thinking of going anywhere near a complaint mechanism or a courtroom to achieve outcomes. And essentially all that it really requires is an understanding because in my view, there's 23 rights protected. You get into nitty gritty and legal argument about what they mean, but at the heart of every single one of those rights is the dignity of a human being. And I think most people understand when someone's dignity is being trampled on. And so if we can, if the community can come to terms with understanding that human rights is really about protecting people's dignity and showing respect, then I think you know, the real value of the act will then have been achieved. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you again for this opportunity. Um, and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. And um, it's such an honor to have someone of your standing not only in your current position, but also those roles that you've played um, in leading up to this position. And a, a beautiful segue about that focus on, on health equity is to welcome back Professor Sandra Creamer, who has been such a valuable part of our school for so many years and such a teacher of mine and actually so many of us in the room and in Zoom. So um, if, we'd really welcome you to focus um, you talk on a range of issues, but as the CEO of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Alliance, that's a huge role that you've played for many years. Um, lots of human rights dimensions there. And then obviously that link to the UN um, Indigenous Human Rights Commissioner in the uh, rapporteur, the special rapporteur um, in, in the previous incumbent. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear about that, as well as your current research here on Project 37. And I'll put up a slide in a moment as you, as you speak. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Nina. Um, again, I've only got 10 minutes and we do have slides of the projects, but I do want to talk about some of my work because I know the other speakers and I don't want to take up their space. They have important messages as well. But for my role as the CEO of the National Aboriginal Women's Alliance, I'm also here in Australia based working with Indigenous women's rights. And one of the issues that I really back for is reproductive rights for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, but not just for that, but it's for all women who are especially in domestic violence, because I believe that our system, our health system should have a safe space for our women, especially when they're going into to the maternity ward or into the hospital, because that sometimes is, <clears throat> sorry, is the only time that they will have their own safe space. But also I do a lot of work working with people, Indigenous people and Indigenous women around this country for their rights to, to just be self-determination and their rights to have an economic security in their communities. Because I don't know if people are aware, but because of the land tenure here in Australia, a lot of Aboriginal people out in remote communities are not allowed to own their own home because of the land tenure. So all of those homes that you see when you look at them out on the TV and you see the homes that they're living in, it's because of the land tenures, which is very sad because everybody should have a right to owning their own home in this democratic system that we're in, but that does not happen. So for us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it's a hard life out there in our communities and people need to understand that we've been here since time began, but we cannot have that right. It's like Nina and I done a, we wrote an article on a 99 year lease for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when it comes to also their basic health, because some communities, if they want the basic health to education, to housing or anything, some of them have to sign a 99 year lease agreement to get that, which is very sad. So what we would like to do and what today, tomorrow is about, is also about educating people, about providing information of the violations of rights of people around this country, in this country, but also across the world. In my international work that I work at, I work with a lot of Indigenous women and a lot of Indigenous men, but I just want to tell you a story of a, a group of women that I have worked with over in Afghanistan as well, and they are the Afghanistan Women's Network. One of my dearest friends that I have, have met, and I would marry her name is, when the Afghanistan, uh, the, when it fell, what happened is that Mary was one of the ladies that had to leave Afghanistan. They had to get her out. She's actually based in another country and we have contact. But the thing was that Mary, how brave her heart is. She started the first women's shelter in, in Kabul for women of domestic violence. She also sh uh, started the first restaurants for women in domestic violence, only having women in domestic violence uh, working at that restaurant in Kabul. So what happens now? Those women have lost their rights. That's what today, tomorrow is about, international human rights. I could tell you a story of every country where there is a violation of somebody, a woman, a man, a child's right. And that's what we've got to really get the message out, especially here in Australia, because sometimes we have that she'll be right out of Jude and, and people don't want to get involved or, you know, they don't really understand the depths of what human rights is about. Everybody has a right to have a voice, to have an education, to have basic health, to have freedom. But that's not happening in this world. The work that I do internationally as well is with women over in, in, in South America, in Africa, and, and here in, in, in Australia, is in particular with domestic violence and the, and the invisible women in this world because of in, domestic violence is shameful. And they have a right to be a woman, to have dignity, to be a mother, to be an aunt, to be who they wanna be. But those violations are breached all of the time. And it's up to us to really understand stories to so that we can go out and back and make changes to legislations, amend policies, so that people do have that right. So I'd like to go on now about the project that I'm doing here in Australia. 
am at the university and also I've done quite a bit of work with the, in combined with my work as the CEO of the National Aboriginal Women's Alliance with Nina. And one of the things that we done was working with in Indigenous people out in remote communities for water. They do not have water, the basic rights to water out there. Their water is bore water. Some of them, some of the waters, most of the water has got E. coli in it. And the sad part about it is what happens when you don't have safe water, when you don't have safe housing, when you don't have air conditioning like a lot of houses out in remote community, then your health deteriorates. Your health is about your mental health, your physical health, as well as your spiritual health. And that's why people then stay in trauma. People have trauma behaviours. It's not bad behaviour, it's trauma behaviour because people are losing and not having that basic right to, to what other people should have or what they should have in this country. I'd like to uh, thank um, uh, Nina and I'd like to thank uh, Carla, who's here in the room. She's one of the teams that we work on on our project out and also Scott for his work that he does in the Human Rights Commission. And so what we did in, in our project is that we decided that we would go around and the project is, as you can see, Project 37, Advancing Equitable Non-Discriminated Rights-Based Access to Health Services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples. And myself, Marie, uh, Professor Marie Toombs, Dr. Claire Brolin, Dr. Caitlin Curtis, and myself, as well as our research officer, Carla Di Capra, we've been out to many communities. We've actually been traveling, I think, to nearly eight communities, eight places around the, in Queensland, talking about the new Human Rights Act and how people have a right under that Human Rights Act. And the sad part is that we have come across and listened to so many voices of discrimination and the barriers that they suffer when they go into the, into the health system or when they're accessing health. And I want to tell you about a policy. When we went out to Mount Isa, there's a policy out there that if you're from a, from Northern Territory or somewhere that, and you're not registered in Mount Isa, and, and we do have a lot of um, Aboriginal people from across the border who are living in in Mount Isa who aren't registered. So if they, for example, were sick and their countrymen, their brother, sister, or mother, their mother or aunt were sick and they're not registered, and they're still got all of their addresses and everything are in the, uh, in Northern Territory, though they've, they, they've been living in Mount Isa for quite a number of years or something. If they get in need emergency assistance to be flown out, they cannot have a carer with them, sadly. And what happens is that people do not understand. People, there are people in this country, Aboriginal people, people of migrant, who do not speak English. Who don't, and, and who can really translate if they need emergency assistance into English. So what happens is that people say, well, I'm not going to go. And their right to health is that they should be able to, policy should change so that they should be able to say, well, at least one carer can go with you on this emergency trip if you need dialysis, if you're having some sort of major heart surgery or something like that. But because of the barriers and the language barriers and the access that are limited around this uh, Queensland, people are not accessing the right health care that they need in this country, uh, in this state. So it's a very sad thing. And one of the other things that a lot of women, and this is in particular for Indigenous women, but also I guess it's uh, women who have been in the system or anyone, we found that a lot of women do not go into antenatal care because of the situations that they are living in or if they've had a child removed. Sadly, those children, the mothers then go into the hospital and within two, within 24 hours, their babies can re be removed from family services because they've had some sort of issue with family services or their children are removed. People should be able to have a fair go and especially our women who are being traumatized when their babies are ripped from them. And then the babies are not getting breast milk, which we know is the most nurturing that they could have in those first couple of days. They're missing out on that. And so their line of health right from the start is not good. But the sad part is that 
there has to be changes in this system to support our women when they are going into hospitals and that they are accessing that because the, this is what we need in to make changes that when a woman goes into hospital, even though she's in a bad relationship or her child has been removed, there should be support systems in place so that she can stay with her child. There should be more support systems in place so that she has a right to continue to have some sort of relationship with her child and, and to seek support and medical needs that she does. I really batten, I've spoke to Scott about this quite often, about reproductive health, which is really important. Our women, and this is one of the things that we found when we've traveled around doing this project. One of the other things is, is, is that the very sad part is, the very sad part is that when people are in remote communities, they have to go down to, to areas of uh, emergency care. If they pass away, then people then have to um, um, pay their own way back. But as we know, tomorrow is an important day. And I think you working in the university, and I've actually um, do a partnership with the new school over in New, new York at the University of New York. We really have to get more involved. It's up to you as students, as people in this university to create that human rights space in the university, to be that voice and to make people understand that all of you are going to go out and work in a community one day. All of you are going to come face to face to somebody who is being discriminated against. So it's up to us and this environment in the university, especially to understand and to, to be a voice and to, to get to know, especially that Human Rights Act that has just come out, to, to talk about it and to have a conversation because we need to be having more of a conversation about human rights and about violations. So again, I'd like to thank everyone. My time's up, but thank you very much. And I really appreciate Nina and uh, for working in partnership with me and putting this on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandra. And I think the value of today is, is we're looking at this act and we're looking at this kind of international concept of a day of human rights, but we're actually hearing about real people's stories and, and what that looks like on the ground. And that concept of intersectionality, that, that human rights um, are relevant to us in so many parts of our life. Is it our gender? Is it our sexuality? Is it our ethnicity? Is it our ability to speak uh, the, the dominant language um, and engage with those with the health services or other services? So um, I'm very thrilled to invite Bilge Özgün, who came to Australia and it's part of enriching our society. She's come from Turkey 14 years ago and, and taken a really long and tough journey, but one with many wins along the way, um, and including being a graduate of this university, which is a win for our university. So we wanted to broaden the conversation to hear from additional voices. And um, so I welcome Bilge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. Thank you, everyone. Hello everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here and happy Human Rights Day for tomorrow. My name is Bilge Özgün, uh, my pronouns she, her. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land which we are all joining today. I am joining you from Trubul and Yegara land um, and I pay my respects to past, present and emerging. Thank you for the opportunity uh, and thank you for uh, UQ Health Department uh, to create this space for us and to share our experiences. Um, first, I would like to start uh, to talk about my diversity story. Uh, my story is really tied being a first generation Turkish Australian. Um, I see that a number of different intersections of identities. Uh, I am a migrant woman and coming from a non-English speaking background. I have been in Australia more than 14 years now and I'm really enjoying being Turkish Australian because I love my multiple identities and multiple belongings, which enables me to have a fluidity in my thoughts and feelings. I was born in Istanbul, Turkey, grew up in a Muslim, large middle class, traditional family. Um, I grew up observing four different kinds of womanhood. My mother, um, teacher, auntie, 
my grandmother, um, she's illiterate. I'm the first woman in my family to complete a master's qualification. So these are the women that had an impact in my own life. Um, fathers were the head of households. So I grew in that patriarchal environment and um, I feel I'm lucky to be in Australia because when I wanted to come here, my, didn't allow, my, didn't, uh, my father didn't allow me uh, to come to be with uh, to, to Australia. And, um, but luckily, um, my brother got a job in Australia and, uh, and he led me to come to be with my brother. So my brother has since gone back uh, to Turkey, but I'm still around. <laughs> so as we are all aware, there are um, lots of barriers to inclusion. And since my arriving in Australia, I personally experienced some of them. Um, I couldn't get a job. My Turkish qualifications weren't recognized. Even after I retrain and gain Australian qualifications, you know, I struggle a lot and I struggled to get a job or even a job interview. And I remember I asked one of my professor, Australian professor, regarding the challenge of getting a job in Australia. And she told me the truth. This system is only built to provide you with an education. It's not here for getting you a job. They will expect you to go back to your country and pursue your career there. That was 11 years ago. Uh, it was my first wake up call. And I remember I asked, how about our dreams, our hopes? Spend so much money to be here, yeah? <clears throat> and I'm, it didn't stop me because I'm a little bit stubborn as you see. <laughs> and so what I did, um, what I did to get my first job, uh, I decided to change my name on the application form. Uh, my name is Nurdan Bilge. Uh, Nurdan is an Arabic name, which means uh, made from light, and Bilge means wisdom. Uh, and in Turkish culture, we believe the names we carry, it affects our lives. Uh, so when I changed my name on the application form to Liz, uh, I got a phone call and I did get an interview and I secured a position. Uh, and once there, I asked them to call me my real name, Bilge, not my nickname. So clearly, I am not alone in this experience. According to the one research of Australian National University, people with Chinese and Muslim sounding names had to submit 68% and 65% more, apl more applications than Anglo-Celtic names to get an interview. So... This system is not currently designed for migrant people's success from getting through the application processes to get an interview, from interview to the usual probation period, and then navigating the Australian workplace culture, being included, heard, understood, and valued as a team member, being included in the decision-making processes, and contributing to organizational success on all levels, uh, to getting promoted or, or progressing to the senior roles, these processes are full of gaps. And bias can get embedded in all sorts of organizational systems and processes. So it is important to ask, how can we bring diversity, equity, and inclusion lenses to all our processes and create lasting impact? So I can easily relate to intersecting inequalities that individuals experience. As I said, intersectionality brings to my life layers of challenges, which help me to understand and reflect on what community needs. Language was a barrier for me, like the other migrants, non-English speaking background migrants. So these experiences inspire me to initiate a community English class project uh, for migrant and refugees around Brisbane and Logan, who studied, completed a certificate individual support in aged care, community and disability services. After a successful pilot, I secured funding valued around 96K and opened 10 classes 
around uh, Logan and Brisbane. So these classes uh, increase the cultural inclusion and with over 100 graduates, 90% gain employment in various healthcare settings. Language learning is a lifelong learning process and requires persistence and dedication. And integration into a new country requires continuous effort. And these classes help cultural and linguistically diverse background peoples achieve their career dreams. And we reach over 20 communities. Through this project, I received 2021 highly commended Multicultural Outstanding Achiever Award. We need to continue investing these programs. It's good for cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds communities and their mental uh, health and their well-being. Migrants' employment is crucial because the work is one of the most vital parts of our life, powerfully shaping our health, wealth, and well-being. Work uh, provides us the ability to support ourselves and our loved ones and can provide a sense of meaning, opportunities for growth. So when people thrive at work, they are more likely to feel physically and mentally healthy. Overall, they contribute positively to their workplace. One minute. Okay. So according to the Diversity Council report, there are more than 3 million people in Australia who are looking for work or who want more work. So these potential workers belong to underrepresented groups. Um, and not only are these workers being left off the recruitment radars, they are all experiencing bias and exclusion in the recruitment process. That's why how we end up seeing so many people with PhDs working as interns and dentists, doctors, surgeons are driving Ubers. I have so many friends like that. And what a ways that Australia can't use this talent in a constructive way. So in order to make a change, we must have a seat at the table and actively participate in the discussion and champion the values of equity and uh, inclusion. Um, I think if we stay in our comfort zones, we won't be able to do the work that's necessary. It, as we all have to take care of ourselves because this road is not easy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bilga Özgün, for sharing your story and your qualifications. And, and that just the focus on meaningful work and how it feeds back into health and well-being, which is something that I think can be overlooked when, when you're not in a, in, a, in a minority position. So thank you for putting the spotlight on that. And we have one more speaker and he's online, um, Dr. Shay Spearings, um, another graduate of this university. And Shay is a Gungaloo man and, and um, he completed his PhD looking at um, the impact of criminalization on Aboriginal men. And again, it's another population um, who are not necessarily seen and um, and the, the the impacts mental health and well-being impacts of people living in incarcerated settings um, obviously are so huge so um, Shay is pretty incredible because he's also um, currently <coughs> nursing COVID and so is joining us on screen um, I have to do this don't I Miller and speak at the same time but He's, he's all ready to go. Fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, Nina, can you hear me? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I can't I see you, know. but I'll put up a slide. Um, Shay, over to you. No worries. Thanks, Nina. I, I don't know who's um, managing the IT. I just can't turn my camera on. I'm more than happy to. But uh, no worries. Tell, uh, we'd love you to hear, hear from you, Shay. So, so just start speaking. Yeah, no worries. So, um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Shay Spearings. Just want to quickly acknowledge country as well, you know, the Turrbal and Yagra country. So I live and work in Brisbane as well, but I'm Gungaloo and grew up in Durrambul country up in Rockhampton. So we're the traditional owners to the area west of that, west of Rockhampton. So Warabinda all the way to the upper Dawson. Um, and for, can't seem to change the setting. Yeah. I've been told that maybe I can turn my camera on. Oh, there you go. So my camera's on. I don't, I don't think you guys can see me yet, but it's on. So we might see how that goes. So, um, 
and just want to acknowledge my elders too. So I've got a lot of people who work in this space in my family. On my father's side, I'm a Mason. Uh, Billy was just talking about names. Names mean a lot to us as people too. Obviously, our nations are really important, but our names, you know, connect our families. And so I'm a Mason and uh, connected to a lot of people across here in Queensland, including Southeast Queensland, obviously Central Queensland. So talking about, you know, this is a really difficult one, but talking about the relationship between the criminalisation and incarceration of Aboriginal men and health and wellbeing and also human rights. That's a huge, you know, there's a huge nexus there. I think if I just want to summarise what it really is, it's just a, it's a relationship that's characterised by the dehumanisation of Aboriginal men certainly in relation to criminalisation and incarceration and how that actually just effectively leads to poor health outcomes because the health and well-being of Aboriginal men certainly isn't accounted for in the processes of criminalisation and incarceration. But before we go down that path too, it's really important to acknowledge that Aboriginal women have been persecuted and suffered immeasurably under colonisation as well. It's just that I think certainly during those initial stages when we saw the rates of incarceration began to really skyrocket, particularly in the 70s. What we didn't necessarily see was the rates of incarceration of Aboriginal women and men following each other in parallel. We're seeing the rates of incarceration for Aboriginal women certainly increasing, certainly in the, over the past few years, particularly the past decade. But we still see 91% of all Indigenous prisoners in, in this country being men. And that's reflected by the way that people were racialized during these, you know, the, the early stages of colonization, but also the constructions of masculinity that were brought across, I suppose, you know, through the processes of colonization. And so the way that Aboriginal men were actually constructed as particular types of threats to the nation state, you know, certainly the colonial state in Australia. So Aboriginal men, you know, were very much so historically, but even in a contemporary sense, characterized as being sexually deviant and violent. And what that really led to was just the way that obviously the criminal justice system is both historically and in a contemporary sense engaged with Aboriginal men, and certainly the way that its arms of law enforcement have continued to engage with Aboriginal men, and the way we've also failed to understand Aboriginal men's actions and activities and engagements with the criminal justice system. And the, the real implication for that is that if we don't understand the truth of why men are engaged with the criminal justice system, then of course we're disempowering communities and responding to this you know, the rates of incarceration, but also the criminalization of Aboriginal people generally, because the experiences are very much so localized and they're embedded in community memories and they're reflected of community histories and community cultures. And I mean that, you know, at a regional level, but even just, you know, at a local town level. And I think failing to understand that means that we'll, we'll never actually address the problem. Just very quickly too, you know, I really want to acknowledge, you know, Arnie Sandra and Nina for putting this on and bringing me here today. And I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. But one of the things that Arnie Sandra was talking about too was domestic violence. And um, it's it's so important. I think one of the things that, you know, really strikes me is that if an Aboriginal man, for example, like if anyone, but certainly for Aboriginal men, you know, is in breach of a domestic violence order and gets sentenced to, a you know, a, an immediate six-month sentence, he can't actually access domestic violence programs in prison because that's only for people who are there for 12 months or more. So we just have all these really weird systemic failures that are just at you know, every stage of the process. And that doesn't necessarily account for whether or not the program is effective or meets the needs of the, the man or necessarily the community that he comes from as well. But so if we understand more broadly the, the, the nature of the system, it's not necessarily, you don't point at any one arm or certainly any agents within the system and say that, you know, that's necessarily what leads to systemic failure. It's just that there are, there are plenty of layers there that all contribute to creating the systemic failure that we see, which is the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the criminal justice system. But it's also really important to note that there are, we've also identified the things that make or lead to overrepresentation, certainly in a contemporary sense. And that's everything from over policing, because we know that leads to um, incarceration. It's a focus on short term risks at the policy level. So people effectively being criminalized or considered to be high risk because they might have prior convictions of the same offense even if that doesn't necessarily mean they're an immediate risk to the community. So they might just have a property related offence, but because they might have several property related offences, then they're not going to get bail and they're not going to get parole. It's as simple as that. So what we actually see is across the country and Queensland's the same, we see Aboriginal people going to prison for almost half the time as non-Indigenous people. What that means is that Aboriginal people are considered to be effectively 
higher in, in so many ways it's, it's so contradictory but it's higher and lower risk at the same time so they consider to be high risk of reoffending, but low enough risk to actually not have to serve too long in prison and that's a huge problem that's a systemic failure the bail acts in this country fail us miserably in queensland we haven't made an amendment to actually account for people's aboriginality uh, victoria is the only state that's actually done that and allows for the courts to consider someone's aboriginality and whether or not they should be eligible for bail because the issue is that if people have prior convictions again, then they're technically considered to be high risk of reoffending if they've gone to jail. And this is for property related offences and breach of you know unpaid fines. Or in Victoria, there was an instance where an Aboriginal woman was caught on a train with a concession fare and not an adult fare. She spent seven weeks in prison while before the, before going before the courts and then being granted bail because she had prior convictions of both property related offences and unpaid fines. So technically not necessarily a risk to society, but was still arrested and then incarcerated for seven weeks. And it wasn't until she went before a judge that she was able to be considered, you know, effectively low risk or non-risk. But also people's aboriginality being taken into account considering that we've been over-criminalised and incarcerated in this country. So there's a higher likelihood we're going to have prior convictions and there's also a higher likelihood that those convictions are going to be questionable. And that's something that people fail to understand and incorporate, I think, into, you know, their engagements, certainly between Aboriginal people and the criminal justice system, and certainly when they're passing judgment. Uh, one of the, the key issues that we face, certainly here in Queensland, is that the prison system is, you know, a set, I guess, a set of fiefdoms. You know, we have superintendents that run each individual prison and they have ultimate control and say over what goes on in that prison, whether or not they actually welcome in elders groups or community justice groups. We have 41 community justice groups across the state here in Queensland. They're all funded through the Attorney General's Department. The Attorney General Department makes available, I think it's $13 million each financial year to fund these groups. These groups are there to actually work with police and the prisoners to actually work with both, you know, people engaging with the criminal justice system or law enforcement, and they can be extremely effective, but it, it really comes down to whether or not law enforcement and both the prison system choose to actually engage with these community justice groups. We're made up of our elders across our communities. The, the real challenge is too, that when, uh, when a person is sent to prison, and I'm just conscious of time here, but when a person is actually sent to prison, particularly an Aboriginal man, again, we see just a, a, fail, a failure to acknowledge, I think, an Aboriginal man's masculinity and the roles and responsibilities that he has in the community. So when we see someone put in prison, you know, which is effectively a dead space, we're again negating our connections to country and the significance of place-based relationships we have. But the issue then becomes about, you know, relationships removal from kin and community. So if an Aboriginal man goes to prison for an extended period of time, then he might lose connection with his children and then effectively his grandchildren. And his roles and responsibilities within his community as both a brother and uncle or grandfather, they're negated and completely, I think, um, misunderstood. And to a lot of people, we would assume that you know, those connections or those relationships are going to be crucial for anyone who goes in the prison system. And to some extent, they are. But I think at the, at the heart of you know, what actually constitutes Aboriginal selfhood, those relationships define people as humans. They don't necessarily define us. And this comes back to our cultural determinants of health and our spirituality. So if you don't have those relationships, then you can't be a person. You can't be a human being. You don't exist as a human being in an individual sense in a lot of our communities. You exist as a human being in relation to your connection to other people and to the place that you come from. And that's extremely important. And the prison system is extremely effective at cutting those ties to those relationships. And it makes it critical. Uh, I think it really impedes Aboriginal men's ability to reintegrate in communities. And it stops communities from maintaining relationships with a lot of Aboriginal men. And we see this again in the way that prisons are actually run whether or not people are prevented from accessing prisons. And that happens in certain prisons. It happened up in central Queensland following a particular incident. Community justice groups and elders groups were not allowed to visit the prisons for a period of time. And again, this creates a lot of issues for men who are undergoing um, all sorts of problems and including women as well. Nina, I'm conscious of time. I'm not sure how we're going. Yeah, this is fantastic, Shay. And um, so I might just pause you there just at this moment because I'd like to invite the rest of the panellists and speakers onto the stage and I'm keeping you up in the centre of the stage. So you're actually the biggest of all, Shay. <laughs> um, so um, Sandra and Bilge and Scott, if you could come back and join us. So um, the, the event finishes at 11.15, followed by morning tea outside. And I'll um, actually, Miller, if you're able to provide the the um, microphones, that'd be fantastic. So, so we're we're 
racing towards the end. Um, thank you, Scott. And um, and I've asked Scott, to, as we've been discussing, to, to be able to take some notes and kind of give a wrap up at the end. So I'll start in the room, um, the physical room, and then I go to the Zoom. Um, thank you, Carla. I'll, um, so if anyone, so I might take the questions that are here and then the panel can kind of respond in, 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 um, unis in, in bulk. <laughs> so um, Tico, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so my question is for Professor uh, Ibrahim Ashbishta, the book. So it's about racing racism in Queensland. So racism often manifests in you know, the forms of exclusion and discrimination. It often manifests um, as a happy kind of inclusion or the idea like which is a bit more but also because of our imbalances. And this happened across different settings. Um, and I can share with you my own experience of engaging for my own um, health condition, my own chronic conditions uh, in healthcare settings. That before I had the access to Medicare and I got some help from the clinics to be able to uh, access uh, medications through their kind of subsidy process. So, in a way, it looks like an inclusive approach from the healthcare setting. But with that inclusive approach comes this pressure to feel grateful for the access. And there are a lot of instances where that kind of um, um, attitude of helping people, but we want you to act in a certain way that actually is a form of racism, it's not being acknowledged enough. And then in my own research, and I'm studying Asian gay men and sexual health, and these are new people coming into the country, and they're struggling to kind of understand how racism actually manifests in this country. And that actually has real implications. And what's really sad about it is that uh, in this sexual environment in Australia, many of the gay men and women white actually knew what racism is. And they get, get to decide whether that, that could be considered as racist or not. And so all of this, and one more example is that, you know, in my previous workplace, you know, I got two senior staff who actually said that uh, they attended your Human Rights Commission training. And in one occasion, they said that what I said was considered to be racist according to training from your organizations, only to get it wrong. So two white women went into training from your organization and got it wrong about what, what, what racism is. So all of these is clear examples of how racism actually goes beyond discrimination as described in the act. So I want to know in your observation as a lawyer, as a human rights commissioner, do you think that this legal approach to race and racism has skewed people's understanding of what racism actually is? And second, what do you think is the role of the Queensland Human Rights Commission to actually improve everyday people's racial literacy? Sorry, can you just repeat that second bit? Um, what is the role of the organization to improve racial literacy? Racial literacy. So, so Scott, what we might do is just capture any more questions online and in the room, and then all the panelists can respond. But obviously, that's got some real specifics. That's so powerful, Tico. Thank you so much for bringing those stories, but also really tangible questions. Um, are there are other questions in the room. Yeah, and thank you, Miller, for being the runner. Apologise to people on, online that you didn't hear full extent of Tico's question. Thank, thank you. Uh, mine will be for Scott as well. Um, I was actually shocked with the information that you brought. I have been, I'm also a woman immigrant. I've also been in Australia for 14 years and um, I'm from Brazil. And the human rights, the main uh, uh, articles from the human rights from the UN, it's in our constitution. So for me, it was like, what? It's, it's not in here? What, how does that work? Um, so it, it, it is shocking to hear that, and it's even more shocking to hear that it's only three places in Australia, so here, ACT and in Victoria, they actually do embrace that. Um, I would like to know, so before, because Australia is uh, um, original signatory of the, the human rights, right? What did it mean then? Like, what does it mean then, like not having an act uh, or, or not being on the... the legislation you know that's mostly sharing my shock but also asking like what do you mean yeah thank you so much and i'll just briefly go to carla um is, has anything come through online so okay so no questions all right so scott you really 
are in the spotlight here, but um, Sandra and Bill go on stage and then Shay on screen. We might come to you last, Shay, just to manage the flow. Any any responses and thoughts? Um, your name, sorry. Uh, Theo. Um, very good uh, question. Um, the idea that service providers would view their customers' clients as objects of charity as opposed to holders of human rights is something that I think um, is a challenge right across the world. And in Australia, we've still got some way to go, uh, particularly because of the outsourcing of government services to various uh, community bodies. A lot of them are faith-based service providers that are still holding on to that charity model of service delivery. So that one, that thing that you pointed out, I think is really relevant. And there's a lot of work to do to ensure that people are seeing that when they're providing services, they're not doing it as an act of charity. They're doing it because the person on the other end is a, a holder and a, a rights bearer. Um, in terms of um, the ability of our laws to address discrimination, particularly racial discrimination and intersectional discrimination. That is a huge challenge. And um, it's a challenge I have to deal with all the time because whilst wanting to promote the laws that we oversee, I also don't want to oversell them and build false hope as to what can be delivered through the laws. So there is, there's a limitation to what actually can be achieved with, with laws, but, it, and it, and at the moment, the burden of enforcing our discrimination laws really does rest with the victims of discrimination. So the pamphlet that you held up before is the building belonging report, which is a review of the anti-discrimination act that the commission did delivered earlier this year. This, the central thrust of our recommendations is that, that that burden be taken away from complainant from complainants and placed on organizations to have a positive duty to take positive steps to ensure that there isn't a you know culturally unsafe um, space whether it's a workspace or a community space um, that is is an environment in which discrimination is not allowed to flourish so i guess that's the response I would make is a very good question. Thank you. In relation to that, <laughs> that other question. So Australia signed up to, you know, the two major covenants on, on human rights protections um, and have, but those uh, rights that are protected at international law are only protected in Australia to the extent that they are um, introduced through domestic legislation. So in Australia at a national level, we have, you know, the Race Discrimination Act, Sex Discrimination Act, Age Discrimination Act, Disability Discrimination Act, but we don't have a comprehensive act that protects human rights at a national level. Um, there's a, a case that's building for one, and I wouldn't be surprised if the current Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, took up that challenge, um, if not in this term of government, perhaps the next if the Commonwealth government are re-elected. But at the moment, we've only got Queensland, ACT and Victoria that have human rights protections. And it is something that people are genuinely surprised to know that human rights are not protected in law in Australia. Pretty powerful thing to find out the day before Human Rights Day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've got such a stellar panel to kind of crack open the situation and take us forward. So I'm aware we're, 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 we're right on the edge of time. So in, in this order, Sandra, Bilga, Shay, and then back to Scott, if you'd like to leave us with something that you'd like us to know as we head into Human Rights Day, and then I'll ask Liz to come down and close the event. I'll just let the other two speak because I do want to read a short quote so I'll get it from my phone. So if you can go ahead then. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I really like, uh, like to mention um, here a couple of 
things to consider to change for the better to take away. Um, migrants have a lot to offer and really looking at revisiting the recruitment processes in our in our organizations. How are we hiring someone from non-English speaking backgrounds? Um, are we giving enough time in interviews of people from non-English speaking backgrounds to answer the interview questions? During the pandemic, we struggle a lot. The interview process was not really inclusive at all. And are you giving, um, are there any representatives from cult backgrounds in the selection panels? Do you invite people for interviews based on their resume? Is there an unconscious bias towards people with names you are not familiar with? Is there any bias based on country of origin? And how can you ensure that recruitment process is fair and inclusive? And if you are lucky to get into the job, um, after recruitment, what kind of trainings and developments are available to keep the migrants uh, in the workplace? What kind of retention strategies in place? And if there are, how effective? Um, is there any mentoring opportunities? Briefly, there is a shortage of effective mentors for women non English speaking background. This may lead to feeling of isolation due to an inability to recognize and adjust the institutional politics or to access the institutional resources. And most migrant people have been stuck in low skill and low paid jobs. Retention and promotion in the organization can be a dream for many migrant and migrant women. So is there an equitable uh, pathway for career advancement and everyday experiencing of microaggressions caused on emotional tax on migrant employees, we need safety and security. And how can we ensure that we create a, a healthy and psychologically safe working environments? And, and what kind of feedback mechani mechanisms in place? Um, so this is I can add. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes. I'm just going to make it short because I know that I'd really like to hear what Shay's got to say. This is a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, and I heard this at um, Scott's uh, when he launched his Human Rights Act, and I thought it was very fitting for today. Where, after all, do, hum do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close that so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Such are the places where every man woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning elsewhere. Thank you. Oh, powerful. Shay, over to you. Thanks, Nina. And thanks, Sandra, Scott and Billia. Um, I think just quickly, I didn't touch on it, actually, if I was talking about you know, the relationship between Aboriginal people and the criminal justice system being one of dehumanisation. Aboriginal people are the most incarcerated people on the planet on a per capita basis. And I think a lot of people don't really understand what that means. You know, in, in across Australia, we're incarcerated at a rate of uh, 2,200 to 2,300 per 100,000 people. So, you know, 2 to 3% of the population, or sorry, sorry uh, yeah, 2% of the population will be in and out of prison throughout a calendar year any given year but if you actually look at that by gender so aboriginal men it goes up to about 4300 here in queensland per 100,000 then if you actually break that down by age it goes anywhere up to 10,000 per 100,000 in some states so i think people need to understand the scope of criminalization and incarceration and what this really means in our communities and that means that you know you're going to be very hard pressed to find an aboriginal family in this country that doesn't have an immediate family member who's in and out of the criminal justice system, regardless of their standing, their socioeconomic class. <clears throat> now, I don't think I know a single per a single family who wouldn't have, you know, a member of their family who's in and out of the criminal justice system on a given day. And, um, and for my family, that's certainly the case. But at the same time too, that doesn't mean that people should be reduced to numbers. I think what we need to understand is that, you know, that's what the system does. For me, working with Aboriginal men, particularly men who might have violent histories, say, the things that I really like engaging with men about, so the things that matter to them. And um, just to leave you with this, 
you know, I work with a lot of different men across Queensland and the things that they find in prison are the opportunities to actually engage with other, other men, other Aboriginal men in really meaningful ways. And one of the things that's always stuck with me, and it's really common, is that we might have a lot of men in prison who didn't, can't read and write. So other men will put their hands up to actually write letters to other men's immediate family, their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunties, because it's always women that they're writing to. It's always very meaningful women in their lives. And they'll, they'll trust other men to go through the process of writing these letters for them and sending them out and then reading them back to them when they get responses. Men, you know, they know what they need. It's just that the system doesn't necessarily provide, but there's plenty of opportunities for us to work at a very local and community level to, I think, work with men's strengths to keep them out of prison. And I think to effectively fight back against the criminal justice system by empowering communities. And it does have to, be, it does have to happen at a community level. It has to be very much so a localised experience. We can support that at a policy level, but we need to be working with communities and meeting their needs. So I'll just leave it at that. that that's really appreciated. Thank you, Shay. Um, Scott, your final words and then Liz, if you could. Yeah, my final word is that I uh, really enjoyed this session and I really wish I could just employ uh, both Bilga and uh, Shay at the commission. Um, both of you spoke really well, and uh, you know this. This we could talk about this all day, but um, from Sandra's discussion, the things that really um, came home to me is you know the, the systemic uh, nature of the problem, in, particularly in health, and the problem of uh, specialised uh, siloed service delivery not treating the whole person. That is in itself, the, you know, the the essence of systemic discrimination. Um, the need for trauma informed services, uh, and Bilga, the racism in employment is something that um, we don't see in the complaints from the at the commission because um, we do see a few, but I think it is so overwhelming and race. Racism is really difficult to prove, and that's one of the problems we've tried to tackle in that report. Um, but I thought the point you made about the waste of productivity in having all these overseas trained professionals driving around Brisbane in Ubers, you know, that if if the decency argument doesn't win, at least the economic argument should win. It's just a waste of resources to have, have those talented people not being utilised. Um, Shay, um, I'd seriously like to have a conversation with you about your future employment situation. Um, the the dehumanisation of Aboriginal men is, you know, at the core, and, and as Shay said, obviously it goes right back to first contact. Um, and I would encourage everyone uh, to really learn about the history of Queensland. Um, not not many people really actually understand what happened and why it is that Queensland Police today really are continuing to repeat the habitual patterns that were established back in the 1800s. Um, that point uh, Shay made about the short sentences um, demonstrating that, that Aboriginal men are sitting in prison, not because they actually pose a threat to the community, but because they have this record, criminal record, that is the product of that relationship with police in many cases without oversimplifying it. Uh, and finally, the community justice groups, it's great to see them recognised. They do fantastic work, but again, they're underutilised, under-resourced and not supported to, to fulfil the role that they probably could, um, given that they do in many cases hold the authority of, of their community and reflect the self-determination of communities. So on that note, um, I'd probably wrap it up and just thank you all again for attending. Thank you for showing an interest in human rights. And when, when you wake up tomorrow and have your coffee, think about how lucky you are to live in a country that you know, you're allowed to actually get up and have a coffee, but we still need a National Human Rights Act to protect our rights. And just quickly, thanks to all those who have come online and, and I know there are organisations on there with their uh, employees and their workers. So thank you very much to all those who have come online. Thank you.
Thank you, um, everyone, Scott. I think you said it. We, we've only scratched the surface and, and we could continue speaking all day. But thank you, Scott, Sandra, Ilga, and Shay. Shay, you'll have to come in person at some point and we, we can give you our, the presence that we have for the others. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And we um, hope you all join us for morning tea out in the corner. Fantastic. Thank you.